Hey everyone, it is Dave. Welcome into our second lecture in our series for Introduction to Art. This is called The Language of Art, and it deals with some of the most important vocabulary we're going to have the entire semester. We're going to learn how to categorize art into either being representational, abstract, or non-objective. We also have the terms form, content, and iconography. Out of all the images that we're going to see throughout this lecture, the most important is going to be near the end of the lecture. It's called the Arnolfini Portrait by Jan Van Eyck. So with that, I hope you enjoy the lecture. So when I first start telling my classes about the language of art, I put this image up on the screen. And in real life, this painting is not very large. It's about the size of a license plate on a car. And I ask what the students are seeing, and of course, they always shout out that we're looking at a pipe. But in French, underneath, we have the words, si, si, n'est-ce pas, un pipe, which translates into, this is not a pipe. So I always challenge them to figure out then what they're looking at. Now, the correct answer, and the one that Magritte is trying to tell us, is that, no, this is not a pipe, all it is is a painting of a pipe. It's the way that the artist chooses to represent this object in art because art has its own distinct visual language. It's not unlike looking at this series of images where we have at the left a photograph of a tree, in the center we have a line drawing of a tree, and in the far right we have a set of symbols that in English spell out the word tree. So none of these is really any closer to a real tree than any of the other images. Art is going to fall into one of three specific categories, and these are some of the most important terms that you're going to learn over the course of the semester. You want to be able to classify art into these three categories, and fortunately, the categories are really easy to define and place articles within it. So for representational art, this is art that resembles the real world. Objects in the artwork, such as a tree, a car, a house, a person, a cat, would easily be identifiable because they look or appear natural. Now throughout the history of art, this is our goal, as we learned in the roles of the artist lecture, that one of those roles was to record the world that art serves as documentation. And that's what we need is to see individuals, people, places, events of their time and place, and representational art does that really well. Representational art, and I should also mention at this point too, that when you start to write down the definitions for the terminology that's on the study guides, make sure to use your own terms and your own ideas because it's going to be much easier for you to remember something that way. For me, uh, this is the definition that I like to use, but if you come up with a better one, you're more than welcome to use it. But keep in mind also, the basis of this class is conceptual. It's being able to apply the terminology to the artwork is essential. Whether you can recall the correct definition or not doesn't really matter as long as you can apply the terminology. So when we look at the lighthouse at two lights, this is an excellent example of a representational artwork. Everything looks and appears normal. We can identify the lighthouse, the clouds in the sky, a hillside with brush and shrubbery, grasses. Everything looks and appears normal. And again, throughout most of art history, this is what we're trying to achieve. In the roles of the artist lecture, we learn that this is not a real location, that it's a romanticized version of the West. But again, everything is recognizable from the mountains in the background to the waterfall, to the lake, the people and animals, everything looks normal. From mythological scenes to religious scenes, if we can identify the objects, this is representational art. 
Now, in the early part of the 1900s, I like to joke around that art gets involved with drugs and alcohol and things go bad. And we have the invention of abstract art in 1907. Now, the top definition I'm actually going to come back to in just a little bit. But most importantly, you want to do the translation in the center there. We can identify the objects, but they don't appear natural. I also want to put in here that abstraction must be derived from something. We must have an object first, and then we transform it into something else. My example is going to be, first off, is this tree. It's a painting by Mondrian, and the tree looks pretty normal. It's pretty recognizable. I would classify it as representational art. But when we start to look at the tree form itself and what Mondrian starts to do with it, it becomes less about a tree and more about line and shape and color to the point where when we start to get to some of these images here, if you weren't told that it was a tree at first, you might not be able to recognize the object itself. It's more about the formal elements than the object. And that's what abstraction is. Now, the very first painting of abstraction was one we talked about in the roles of the artist lecture, La Demoiselle de Avignon. And this painting made Picasso famous. It came out in 1907, and for about 10 years, the public did not see this painting. It was seen only by the close friends of Picasso, and some people absolutely loved this painting, others absolutely hated it, but either way, this is really what makes Picasso so famous, is he invented an entirely different type of painting. So, La Demoiselle de Avignon is a painting about courtesans or sex workers. Avignon was a street in Barcelona where all the brothels were, and this scene is us walking into one of those houses. Now, this is supposed to be a hot, seductive painting, but the women it's themselves, and we can identify that they're women, do not appear natural. And that's really the basis of abstraction. That dense definition up top that I had talked about earlier was the rendering of objects in a stylized or simplified way so that while they're, they remain recognizable, their formal or expressive aspects are emphasized. And what Picasso did in his painting was he took those organic female forms and made them geometric. He took curvilinear line and made it rectilinear. He also muted a lot of the color that was present. The problem we have with abstraction is it is very autographic, meaning that each artist creates abstraction a little bit differently. Picasso, for instance, the figures are very recognizable. With Duchamp, it's much more of a heightened sense of abstraction where we can barely tell that this is a human figure walking down steps. And it's been superimposed on itself like two or three times in different positions. But we can make out the bend of the knees, those arcs, which are called lines of force that propel the body forward. We can identify the hips, the torso, and the shoulder area. But we don't know if the figure is male or female, we don't even know if it's uh, robotic. We also have a term called non-objective. Now, non-objective is a rather new term. Uh, it's maybe been around since the 1990s, uh, sometimes called non-representational art, meaning that this is as far away from representational art as you can get. It's art that makes no reference to the natural world. So we can't say this looks like a house or a car or a person. It is just paint on a canvas. We can only talk about these artworks through the formal elements such as line, shape, and color. So when we start to look at non-objective art, it's gonna be paintings like Pollock. And this painting is all about paint and surface. That's all it is. 
once again, its line, its shape, its color, it's not a house that's been transfigured. Now, I point out that this is a recently coined term. So back in 1947, when Pollock created this painting, this was classified as abstraction because that's the only other term that artists had. It was either representational or abstract. By the time we get to the 1990s, we're able to have this third category that better identifies these types of works, where instead of a figure being distorted, it's just paint on a canvas. So even though Jackson Pollock is considered the leader of the abstract expressionists, that's only because no other term existed at that time. So back in the 40s, this was abstraction, today and specifically on the exams you're going to be taking, make sure you classify this as non-objective. The same can be said for Malevich's work here. Now keep in mind there's not a whole lot of artworks throughout the semester that I want you to know the name of. This one is easy. Make sure you know the name of this painting. And how is he famous? I have no idea because I'm not famous and he is for doing something as silly as creating a black square or a red square and for his really complex works is where we have two shapes so we're going to take a moment here to review the three different types or categories of art representational art Think of it as one wall in a particular room. It is finite, and if it looks like the real world, it's representational art. The wall opposite that is the non-objective wall. It is finite as well because it has one specific form of art, something that can only be classified as line, shape, and color. In between those two walls is this gray area, but we can move between the two walls so there's a lot of space for different types of abstraction. Again, abstraction is very autographic to the individual and people create abstraction differently. Sometimes it's like Duchamp, which you see off to the left, that is a very heightened sense of abstraction, whereas Picasso it's a little bit more mellow and much more nearest the representational side of the room. So let's take a look at some artworks. I'm going to throw probably six or seven artworks in a row here and all I need you to do is call out what category you think that this work falls into, whether it's representational, abstract, or non-objective. So here is our first image. This is going to be representational art. As you can see, everything looks the way it should. Abstract art, since this is also a six foot tall baby, you can see how the organic forms are now geometric. We have a lot of rectilinear line. A much prettier baby and photography is definitely representational art. It is art that resembles the real world. It is the most representational form of art since it is an imprint of the natural world. This artwork is just line, shape, and color. So it is non-objective. This work also by Picasso definitely abstract. We can still identify the figures. There's also a dog that's off to the left. This work is representational. We can identify the elements. And our final work is non-objective. And this is a painting you're going to see in many of the lectures over the first half of the semester. Uh, it is very much like the term art. It's a simple word, but it's very complex in its meaning. 
this is a painting exactly like that. It's very simple. You and I can both create it. However, it is extremely complex when we start to break it down. So the next two terms are form and content. And you normally hear them being spoken of together, very much like arts and crafts, peanut butter and jelly, mac and cheese. And the terms, though, mean different things. So let's take a look at form first. And form is the purely visual aspects of the work. The cool thing about form is that all art has it. It's how the artist is going to apply the formal elements and principles of design, everything from line, shape, and color to balance and focal point. That is all form. Now, the painting at the right by Mondrian that has form. This painting by Jan van Eyck also has form. So it is different forms. However, it is still form. When we switch over to talking about content, now we're talking about subject matter, story, narrative, information. It's the idea that the artwork is trying to communicate to the viewer. Now, whether it is successful or not, that is another story. But not all artwork is going to have content. Sometimes art is just purely aesthetic. And for us in uh, art introduction, uh, introduction to art class or art appreciation class, the work at the right doesn't really have any content. The same thing with Pollock's work or Malevich's work such as Black Square. There's really no subject matter to those works. However, in Van Eyck's painting, there is subject matter. There is a story, a narrative, and we can uncover that information through the idea of iconography. Iconography is the study of the meaning of images. It is how we as art historians look at paintings to decipher their meanings. It's through the icons that are present within them. And so it's really fun. It's kind of like playing detective. And what I'd like you to do with this painting is take a look at it and create your own narrative about what is going on in this work. Don't look this painting up. Just, you know, just start writing down some ideas and what you know about this work. The title is the Arnolfini Portrait. It was painted around 1434 by the artist Jan van Eyck. This is the most famous artist in Northern Europe at the time. And this is one of the first paintings ever created with oil paint. So it's kind of famous for that reason as well. So why don't you put this video on pause for just a minute or two gather your thoughts about it, and then I'm going to walk you through the details of this painting. All right, so let's take a look at some of the details of this painting that give us some clues to what's happening. Now, the first thing that students normally come up with when I'm in a classroom setting is that the woman at the right is pregnant. And she definitely looks pregnant, but she's not. It is very common, especially in the 1400s, with such high infant mortality rates, that a woman would be painted as being pregnant in hopes that she would soon become pregnant. We also see that they're holding hands in a rather odd fashion, and sometimes it appears that the gentleman at the left is like blessing her or blessing her child. Also, it could look like they're perhaps getting married. And one of the earlier titles of this work was the Arnolfini Marriage Portrait. If we add in the fact that green, rather than white, is the traditional color of the wedding dress back in the 1400s, that adds a lot more credence to that this is some type of nuptial taking place. We can also tell that these people are very wealthy. Uh, first of all, just to have a, a painting done of yourself is very, very expensive. 
we look at the sumptuous interior, particularly the textiles that are present, and we know that they have a lot of money. Particularly though, the chandelier is of interest because even though it's a very expensive item in the home, there's only one candle. And when we see one candle in an artwork such as this, this indicates a religious theme. It is usually the presence of Christ. And particularly at a wedding event, that would be common. When we look at the mirror and the very back of the room, to the left of the mirror is actually a rosary. Around the mirror are the Passions of Christ. Within the mirror are four figures, the backs of the two that we see in the painting, but also the artist and a person who is dressed as a priest. Now above the mirror is kind of this beautiful script and it says Johannes van Eyck, which is the artist's name, and also this Latin term, fuhic, which translates to was here. So he kind of basically signs this painting as if it were a wedding document, as if it were a, a wedding license in a way, and serving basically as witness to this event. Now, today we normally consider artists sign their work as common practice, but that is not common practice back in the 1400s. In fact, it's signing an artwork is very contemporary in idea, and it's right around the mid-1800s where that becomes more standard. When we look off to the left on the cabinet, there are citrus fruit, and being that this painting is done in Northern Europe, this also lets us know that these people are wealthy since they imported this fruit. The shoes kicked aside, God's commandment to Moses, remove your shoes on holy ground. The dog, symbol of fidelity or loyalty, definitely good that it's present during a wedding scene. And up top of the bedpost is St. Martha or St. Margaret, and she is the patron saint of childbirth. You'll also know that the woman is positioned nearest the bed, which is where she would give birth, whereas the man is positioned by the window, representing the outside world, where he is going to be out making a living. I throw this image at the right end because this is the very first work of art that was signed by an artist. It was signed by the Athenian artist uh, Euthymides, and he signed it, Euthymides Painted Me. And it's a really cool work, it's called Revelers, and it's basically a study of a guy who is drunk and dancing around. This is a picture of that dog breed in the painting. It's called an Athen Pincher. And besides the ideas of loyalty and fidelity, it is also a rare breed of dog. So that just adds to the wealth of this couple. Here's how the painting looks in the National Gallery. It's not very large. It's only about 30 inches in height. And when we shoot it with infrared beams, uh, we can see kind of how the artist created this very basic image. And one of the reasons I don't really care for this painting is that the details of the painting are incredible, and I love those. But when you start to look at the faces of the individuals in the painting, they just don't look real, and that kind of takes me out of the work. They look very doll-like, very fake, very porcelain, but looking at it through infrared here, we can see that they do look a little bit more human and a little bit more natural, especially the woman at the right. Now, in art history, we love to make fun of classic paintings. The artist at the right, his name is Fernando Botero, and he is a Colombian artist, and he definitely has that iconic imagery with the figures that are a little bit more plump, a little bit more round, and look at what he's done as far as taking many of the items in the painting and changing it, such as the chandelier becoming a single light bulb hanging from a cord. 
his work is very sought after. So if someone offers you his work for free, definitely take it. Uh, he is a very sought after artist. So I will see you at our next lecture, which is on space and the illusion of space.